Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Sally and Richard for the opportunity to talk at this symposium. Today, I will give you a brief overview of the uh, work uh, my lab has been doing under a GSAP grant during the past few years. As we all know, sustainable development of our modern society requires renewable and environment-friendly uh, energy sources. And plants have great potential to make significant contributions to this. Plants can harvest solar energy and convert it to chemical energy and store it in biomass. Uh, one way of using biomass for energy is to convert it to biofuels. We know that the use of fossil fuels generates a net increase of the carbon dioxide in atmosphere, so which has been considered to be a major factor contributing to global climate change. Because plants can fix carbon dioxide during photosynthesis, it forms a closed carbon cycle. So this will greatly uh, mitigate the environmental problem associated with the use of fossil fuels. When we consider using plants for fuels, for energies, we do not want to compete with their use for foods and feeds. Because in addition to the energy problem, we are also facing a challenge to, feed, to meet the needs to feed an ever-increasing world population. So the best way to go is to use the non-edible part of the plant. The non-edible plant biomass is largely composed of secondary cell walls, which contains three major components, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. So it's also called lignocellulosic biomass. The cellulose and the hemicellulose are polysaccharides, and lignin is a highly heterogeneous phenolic polymer. Utilization of lignocellulosic biomass for biofuel production requires the hydrolysis of the cell wall polysaccharides to their uh, component monosaccharides. This process is called cell wall sacrification. And the monosaccharides then can be utilized by microbes for fermentation uh, to produce fuels, such as ethanol. The presence of lignin in the cell wall limits the accessibility of the cellulose and the hemicellulose, and thereby impedes uh, the biomass to biofuel conversion. And currently, a costly pretreatment step is required to enhance the efficiency of this process. As you can imagine, a straightforward strategy uh, to reduce the cost for biofuel production is to generate feedstocks with low, lower lignin content. And during past two decades, the lignin biosynthetic pathway has been largely elucidated, and the lignin manipulation has been successfully achieved in various species. Indeed, plants with repressed lignin bio biosynthesis do show enhanced cell wall sacrification efficiency. However, there is a small problem. Plants with reduced lignin <coughs> typically show reduced growth and as a, as a result, loss of biomass. This significant yield penalty makes those plants unsuitable for real applications. Here I'm showing you an example in Aerodopsis thaliana. As you can see the, on the left side, the wild-type plant is nice and tall. And on, on the right side, it's a raphate mutant. This is a lignin-deficient mutant. Uh, it, it's severely dwarf. 
So the, the association between uh, lignin reduction and the growth reduction has been widely observed in many other species, including tobacco, medicago, poplar, pine tree, uh, maize, uh, rice, and sorghum. Despite its wide occurrence, it is unclear why this, this so-called lignin modification-induced dwarfism occurs. If we, know, if we know the mechanism underlying this phenotype, then potentially we may be able to disentangle lignin modification from the growth inhibition so we can maximize the biomass yield for the lignin-optimized biofuel feedstocks. There, there are uh, a few uh, possible ex explanations for uh, lignin modification-induced dwarfism. So the most popular hypothesis is this water stress hypothesis. And this is based on the observation that many lignin-modified plants show a collapsed xylem phenotype. On the left of this slide, I'm showing you the xylem of a normal growing wild type poplar tree. The xylem is a vascular tissue that conducts water transport in plants. So the, trying to, sorry. So the, uh, the wall of the xylem is heavily lignified. Um, and this provides the wall of the xylem the mechanical strength to withstand the negative pressure generated during water transport. Because in plants, the water is pulled up inside the xylem vessel by the negative pressure generated from the transpiration, that is, the evaporation of the water from leaves. And in the, in the lignin-deficient poplar tree, as shown on the right, the decreased lignification uh, weakened the, the, the xylem wall. So the xylem wall cannot withstand the negative pressure generated during water transport, so it collapses. And this caused the water deficiency to the plant, uh, which in turn uh, affects the plant growth. Another hypothesis is that maybe there is a signaling metabolite that is important for plant growth, and this metabolite shares the upstream biosynthetic pathway with lignin. So perturbation of lignin biosynthesis will also affect the accumulation of this uh, growth factor. And one such possible uh, candidate is this chemical called dihydrodiconifer alcohol glucoside. And this compound has been found to uh, have the cell promoting activity in tobacco cell culture. And it is derived from conifer alcohol, a major uh, lignin component. Another hypothesis is this cell wall integrity signaling hypothesis. Besides the lignin deficient plants, the plants that are defective in other cell wall components, such as cellulose, as shown uh, on the left, or hemicellulose, as shown on the right, they also show the collapsed xylem and the dwarf phenotype. So this suggests that plants may have a signaling pathway that monitors and responds to the cell wall change and, and regulate uh, the plant growth. My lab has been using uh, the Aerodopsis staliana to study uh, the lignin modification-induced dwarfism. Aerodopsis staliana, or, or in short, Aerodopsis, is the most widely studied model species in plant biology because it has several uh, advantages. It is small. Uh, a well-type plant typically is only uh, 15 to 20 inch high. 
So it can be uh, easily grown in gro growth chamber. And it grows fast from seeds to seeds, only takes six to eight weeks. A single plant can produce a large number of seeds. This is especially useful for genetic screen, where a large number of mutant plants uh, needs to be generated. And it's easy to generate transgenic plants. This is important for gene functional study. And similar to uh, other uh, model organisms, there are a large number of mutant lines uh, and uh, uh, genomic resource available for this species. So we took a suppressor screen approach using the lignin deficient uh, mutant, rafid mutant, the, the one that I mentioned earlier in my talk. So here is the logic behind uh, this uh, uh, strategy. In the RAF8 mutant, there is a mutation in a lignin biosynthetic gene. The disruption of lignin biosynthesis generates a signal. We call it LMID signal. Uh, uh, represents a lignin modification induced dwarfism signal. And the trans transduction of this signal through a genetic pathway uh, will, lead, uh, will lead to the plant growth response, uh, the plant growth inhibition, sorry. <clears throat> so if we disrupt a gene involved in this pathway, then we would expect the small rapid mutant grow bigger. Based on this idea, we can treat the rapid mutant with chemical mutagens to generate mutation, random mutations in its genome and screen for suppressors, screen, screen for the plants that grow bigger. So we call these bigger plants suppressors or suppressor mutant or suppressor lines because the growth inhibition phenotype of the RAF8 mutant is surprised in these, uh, these plants. So by isolating such suppressor plants and identify the causal mutation in those plants, we will find out what genes are involved in the LMID pathway. So we did the suppressor screen and we successfully isolated more than 20 rafid suppressors. As you can see, these suppressor plants, although they are not as big as wild type, they are significantly bigger than the rafid plant. And the isolation of these suppressor lines indicates that the lignin modification induced dwarfism is mediated through active biological processes and can be mitigated by, uh, by uh, genetic manipulation. There are typically several hundreds of mutations in the uh, in a rapid uh, suppressor plant. So we need to do some mapping to, uh, to figure out mutation of which gene caused the, uh, the better growth. Due to the time limit, um, I'm not gonna explain in detail how the mapping works. That could be uh, the content of a full lecture. So instead, I will use this slide to um, outline the process uh, we, we, we used and explain the basic principle uh, by which we distinguish the causal mutation from the numerous background mutations. So basically, we cross a suppressor plant with the ref 8 and generate a F1 plant. And self-pollination of F1 plant will, will give rise to the F2 population. The F2 plants will segregate into two groups based on their growth phenotype. One group of plants will look like suppressor, they are bigger. The other group 
will look like graphite, a small plant. And the, the background mutation has a, a equal distribution within these two pools. But the causal mutation will be enriched in the suppressor look uh, plant pool, the, the, the bigger plant pool. So by sequencing, uh, the bulk sequencing of these two pools of plants, we can measure the frequencies for each mutation in the genome. And based on, based on that, we can identify uh, the candidate uh, causal mutations. So we, we use this approach. We, we mapped uh, the suppressor genes. We call those suppressor genes growth inhibition relieved genes. Because in genetics, uh, the name of the gene uh, is, is, uh, is after, is na the, the gene name is after the uh, mutant phenotype. Uh, that's why we call it growth inhibition relief. But the function, the normal function of the gene actually is involved in mediating the growth inhibition. So it's, it's backward, so don't get confused on that. And this slide, I sh I'm showing you that five of the mutations from five independent suppressor lines were actually mapped to the same gene, uh, the GER1. And to further test if the GER1 gene mediates the lignin modification induced dwarfism in RAF8, we did a functional complementation test. Um, as you can see here, the, the RAF8 GER1 uh, plant, that's the uh, suppressor plant, uh, is sig significantly bigger than the rafate. And when we put a wild type copy of the GER1 gene, uh, indicated by the uh, uppercase letter, then the plant be became uh, smaller, so similar to the rafate. Because in the suppressor, the function of the GER1 is disrupted. And when we introduce the wild type, a functional copy, it's reversed back. So this result indicates that, indeed, GER1 is involved in uh, LMID. So it is a causal gene. And similarly, we, have the, uh, we also identified the other gene. We call it GER2. Um, by doing the uh, same uh, experiment, we can see uh, the RAF8 GER2 plant is bigger than RAF8, and when we put back a wild-type copy of the GER2 uh, by transgenic approach, uh, the, plants, uh, the plant grows uh, smaller. <coughs> Although the, these suppressors are significantly different in terms, in terms of uh, growth phenotype from the RAF8. The, importantly, these suppressor lines still have low lignin. So here I'm showing you the data from the uh, GER2 suppressor uh, as an example. So this, this suggests that the lignin accumulation and the growth inhibition is genetically separable. Now we, we've identified these two um, players in lignin modification induced dwarfism, uh, GER1 gene and GER2 gene. And we, we, we want to further investigate their relationship. So uh, what's their uh, connections within the uh, genetic pathway? So we did a cross between the GER1, uh, ref GER1 and ref GER2 plant to generate the triple mutant. Interestingly, the triple mutant, the, the rightmost the plant, as you can see, it's considerably bigger than either the GER1 suppressor or the GER2 suppressor. So this, this indicates that the GER1 and the GER2 work additively or synergistically in the lignin modification-induced dwarfism pathway. 
And these results also suggest a possibility of improving the biomass of lignin-modified plants by stacking uh, suppressor mutations, multiple suppressor mutations. Now I'd like to summarize my talk for you. The lignin modification induced dwarfism limits the extent of uh, lignin engineering for cellular, uh, cellulosic biofuel feedstock improvement. And my lab has been uh, using Arabidopsis lignin mutant, REF8, to study uh, this uh, important phenotype. And by performing a suppressor screen, we have isolated uh, more than 20 suppressor mutants that show alleviated growth inhibition. And we've, we've verified uh, two genes. Um, now we know these two genes are um, involved in uh, mediating the lignin biosynthesis, uh, lignin modification induced dwarfism. And we also uh, uh, tested their uh, interaction genetically and found they work uh, additively or syn synergistically. And uh, I mentioned that there are uh, more uh, uh, suppressor genes we are working on. Some ongoing work is we try to verify more genes and uh, test their um, genetic interactions, try to uh, put those genes into a pathway to gain a better understanding uh, of the, uh, the mechanism. So finally, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the people in my lab who have contributed to this work. And I'd like to th uh, thank GSAP for funding and thank you for your attention. So with the advent of uh, CRISPR technologies for, um, for modifying uh, even just single letter uh, changes in genes, uh, does that give you a pathway for, for um, doing the, the screens more rapidly or is it, uh, is, is it uh, not helpful in your, in your particular setting? Well, the, the CRISPR uh, technology uh, will uh, greatly uh, improve our ability to uh, engineer uh, the, uh, the plants genetically. But in, in terms of genetic screen, because uh, we, we don't really know which gene is involved in the pathway. Um, and if we, if we know a specific target gene, then, then we can use CRISPR to target that gene, to modify that gene. But uh, from the uh, genetic screen point of view, it's, uh, I mean, you can think of it, uh, you can use it as a mutagen, but you don't really need to go there. You know, the chemical mutagen can, can generate random mutations in the genome, then you can just do the screen. Uh, but in terms of the targeted, I think the most, the, the advantage of CRISPR uh, uh, technology is the targeted editing of a certain gene. Hi. Um, in terms of the transcriptional regulation, how, have you, how far have you gotten in dissecting the role of the, the mutants that you've been looking at so far? Uh, that's, that's a good question. So um, the GER2 gene actually is a transcri transcription factor. And uh, we, um, we did the RNA-seq. Uh, we compared the transcriptome of rapid mutant uh, versus well type and, uh, and as well as uh, uh, the, the GER2 suppressor. And we found that REF8 mutant has a global change in terms of trans transcriptome compared to well type. There are more than uh, 1,500 genes are uh, differentially expressed between uh, REF8 and well type. But then when we compared the uh, the GER2 suppressor with the well type, there, there are only like uh, less than 600 genes changed. 
And the important thing here is like, if you look at the uh, one diagram, about two thirds of the genes that are, we, call it, we can call it misregulated in Ref8 compared to wild type, is normally expressed in the uh, suppressor. So, so the, the global transcriptional change in Ref8 is partially, partially depends on the function of GER2. When we, when, we, when we mutant, when we knock out the GER2 function, uh, we, we can sort of like uh, shift the expression pattern back to more similar to wild type level. Yeah. I have one question. I yeah. the real life experiments. Do you also get suppressors that are outside of the signal transduction pathway? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a good question. Actually, we, we, we found, um, you know, now we have identified uh, a, about a dozen uh, suppressor genes. Some, you know, if you look at the annotation, it's unknown, right? It's uncharacterized protein. We don't really know what they do. And some, uh, are, you know, for some genes, there's annotation we can, you know, have a, uh, 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 some degree of information, but for some genes, it's, it's not studied. So we don't really know if it's outside of the signal pathway or if it's inside. That's why we are, we are now we are making crosses between all these suppressor lines, because so, that's the traditional genetic interaction, the way to study genetic interaction. Then we, we hope to be able to connect the dots to map out the genetic pathway that underlying this. Yeah. Any further questions? So then let's uh, thank Zilu again.